because I had to stay there. And so after a while, I thought, okay, this is crazy. I'm in the middle of a continent in Minnesota. I want to be more international. This is, this is, you know, this feels like the right thing. So I quit my job, um, sold my house, sold my car, sold everything I owned and moved to South America. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 170 of the Kameno Voice. Today I speak with the Executive Director for the Economic Development Council for Island County. Please welcome Sharon Sappington. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kameno Voice podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they're going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome back to another episode of the Kameno Voice, the greatest little podcast focused on Kameno Island in the Northwest. I think I can claim that, right? If anyone has a, um, has a suggestion on it, if someone has something where they're like, no, actually, this is the greatest podcast focused on Kameno Island in the Northwest, please send me an email. Um, I'd love to talk with that person. But for now, I'm claiming that. So welcome to the greatest little podcast focused on Kameno Island and the Northwest here. So uh, thank you guys and welcome back to another episode. Um, We're going to get into our guest in a minute, but how's your week going? Hope everything's going well. Um, We or I just had a crazy week this last week. I'm teaching a class on or not teaching, but I'm mentoring in a class, but also taking the class on Monday and Wednesdays right now. Um, I just started a new book called When Fish Fly, which is about the starting of Pike's Place Market, which anybody that is in the retail business, really any business, but especially in the retail business, read this book. It is such a great book so far. And I haven't even finished it yet, but it's, it's one that I think there's just so much information in there that can be applied in the retail side. Um, anyways, can't, can't uh, recommend that book enough. Um, so there's that. Um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so then getting into this podcast, um, I interview Sharon Sappington, who is the executive director of the Economic Development Council for Island County. Um, you'll sometimes hear that shortened down to the EDC. Um, EDC? Question mark? EDC yeah. statement. Okay. Um, and, and many people actually think that the Economic Development Council or the EDC is a government run organization. Uh, But no, it's completely private. They do projects with the government um, and they're sometimes funded by them, but they are private. So they do, um, they do a lot of work in Island County. Obviously it's for both Whidbey and Camino Island. Um, But they're like right now, one of the classes that I'm taking, I'm actually, it's in conjunction with the EDC that they've done this project uh, and also a group called Rain Catalyst, which they really focus in on building entrepreneurial ecosystems in the, in the areas that they work. Um, so they're, you know, like I said, we'll get into some of this into the, in the podcast, but um, they, the EDC was also really um, monumental in helping during COVID, getting out the words about the grants and the different things like that. Uh, and they're always trying to see how they can help build the local business uh, and economy with new ideas. Um, sometimes that means funding and sometimes that means introduce, you know, how do you find and help new entrepreneurs trying to join into the market? So they do a lot of different things. They're fairly wide ranging. Um, so that, for those of you who don't know, that's the EDC in a nutshell. Um, so they do a ton for Island County. They're really a neat organization. Um, so be sure to check them out. Um, yeah, the, and then the other thing, so I want to talk about as well, prepping for this episode, um, is Sharon, who um, you'll hear a lot of her story, but has just done some like crazy things. She's she's just picked up and left, uh, moved to another country, and um, you know didn't have contacts, didn't have a, not necessarily like didn't have like a job lined up. She had a plan, just not a job lined up. Um, but uh, yeah, I think for those of you who want to be world travelers or you know dream of working in another country or doing something, um, th- I think this is the episode for you because she just really shows like what is possible if you're willing to just take a chance. Um, and uh, the world is so, I mean, global, but like connected now 
that, uh, you know, I think a lot more things are possible than uh, people think. So that being said, this is the final episode of the Commando Voice. See you guys later. I'm kidding. I'm not leaving. Um, but anyways, I just wanted to do that. So anyways, we will be, um, yeah, so we're going to jump into all of that and more. You get to hear her kind of crazy story and then how she ended up with the um, EDC and uh, some of the stuff that they're working on right now. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Sharon Sappington. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Commando Voice. Today, I'm here with the Executive Director of the Economic Development Council for Island County. Welcome to the podcast, Sharon Sappington. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, so before we get started, tell us a little bit about Sharon. Oh, well, um, I wasn't right, really prepared that for that question, even though I knew you were going to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sharon, my... Right now, my whole focus is the Economic Development Council. So everything right now that is about Sharon is about the Economic Development Council. <laughs> <laughs> and right now you are, are probably in the thick of like so many projects right now. Yes. Yes. So awesome. So uh, where did you grow up then? I grew up, I was born in Shreveport, Louisiana, but when I was two years old, we moved to northern Minnesota to a small town on the Mississippi River. Okay. Yep. And that's nice. where I graduated from high school. And then in that state, that's where I went to college and started my career. Got it. So um, as you were growing up, uh, what were the things that were interest? Like, did you kind of have an idea when you were in like a kid, like, I always want to do this when I get older? Um, yeah, in real general terms, we didn't, in my little town, we didn't really have any good, uh, guidance counselors or anything, <laughs> career counselors. And so mm -hmm. we were all each on our own. And so I envisioned that I was either going to be a, uh, classical, um, pianist traveling the world, or I would be an artist doing both painting and sculpture. Okay. Very cool. So when you were in high school, were you taking a lot of these classes and practicing a lot on those things? Yes, I was. I, I had a piano. My mom bought me a piano. Then I was also, you know, playing a lot of other instruments like flute and guitar and even banjo. <laughs> really? Nice. Did you play claw or did you play pick with banjo? Or on the banjo? Yeah. I just used my fingers. Okay. I've never nice. been a big one for picks, even on when I play guitar. I just, it, yeah. Yep. Nice. And do you still play any of these instruments today? No, I don't. I've stopped all of them. However, I did when I lived in Bolivia, I did buy a charango, which is a string instrument they have down there. It's got 12 strings. And I actually took lessons down there and they were all the people in my class were just amazed because here I am, this gringa, singing <laughs> this song about the patriot of uh, Bolivia. So that was pretty fun. So that's the only thing I have really played since then. Oh. That's so cool. Yeah. Sometime you'll have to record yourself doing that and then <laughs> yeah. do a video. That's so cool. Awesome. So then uh, as you graduated high school and kind of looking at like what you're going to end up doing, were you looking still looking at like musical or, or artist classes? Yes. My uh, major in college was piano. And uh, that was great. And then I also, while I was there, I also took up harp and harpsichord. Okay. And that was a lot of great fun. But um, I kind of realized after a while, because, you know, I was like the best in my small town. And then when I joined the University of Minnesota, I was with everybody who was the best in their hometown. And it was yeah. like, okay, do I have that extra passion and ability? And do I want to give up everything in life for that? And the decision was no. Okay. So, so what then, I, did then I moved into art history and studio arts. Um, and then eventually I, you know, I decided to do other stuff. Okay. So as you were kind of going to different majors and kind of bouncing around there, what, where did you go after art history and what kind of prompted you to, to look for the next thing? I actually went into something completely different. I went into mechanical design. Okay. Just like a 180. <laughs> Or 360 or whatever you call it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. What kind of drew you to mechanical design then? Well, it's kind of superficial because I was still kind of thinking art 
And I thought, okay, well, you know, if I'm not like a world famous artist, what can I do to make money with art? And then I thought, well, gee, mechanical designers draw. And so I thought, well, let's try that out. And I went in and it was like second nature to me. I just excelled. And it was just like, yeah, it, it was amazing how how darn easy it was for me. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So did, did you end up finishing that degree out then? Yeah. Well, that wasn't a degree, just mechanical design. Okay. Um, it was a, 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 it was a two year program that I like finished like in six months or something. So I did it really short, fast. Yeah. And then I actually went out and then the, I was a mechanical designer for many years of my first part of my, um, my career. <laughs> okay. Nice. So where did that lead you then when you were, as you were leaving college and, and, starting the workforce, where did you end up starting off at? Well, I had made the decision that I wanted to be really well, a really well-rounded mechanical designer. So I got my first gig with a company just so I could have a one year under my belt. And then after that, I decided I wanted to put myself in a lot of different situations so I could learn from the best and then have experience in different industries. So I joined an organization called I don't remember what it was, but what it really was, was mental rental. Is that what we called it in the industry? And so I would be rented out to companies that needed some um, design projects done. And so I would always grab up like the one or two week projects while a lot of my counterparts wanted like one year projects. I wanted those short ones. I could get into a company. I could get into an industry, learn, and then go to the next one. And so that yeah. was really, really fulfilling. I, I love that. But then eventually I did, I did land, like each one would offer me the job, but I did land uh, one gig and it was like, it was like a three month gig. I was like, oh, this is way too long. But I went into <laughs> it and then they offered me the job and I thought about it and I took it. And that's where I spent many years of my career it was, it was a very large multinational corporation. Okay. Very cool. What were some of the cool projects you got to do during that time period? Well, the consumers don't really know much about these projects. This company, uh, it, it was, a, like I said, a large multinational corporation. I was in the corporate headquarters in Minneapolis. Uh, we had manufacturing around the world and sales around the world. And they, um, they manufacture and sell precision, precision measurement instrumentation for the process industry. Okay. And so we were, and I, when I joined, it was, they were just at the time of doing a whole bunch of new product design, which was for a mechanical designer. It was great. Um, and so we were working on things like uh, vortex meters to measure the flow based on a vortex formula. We were, uh, uh, we did an I to P, a current to pressure converter measurement. Wow. And yeah, it was, it was really, it was really great fun. And these products are currently all over the world in refineries. We did a lot for power, uh, power plants, um, paper, sewage, chemical. I mean, everything that you can think of that go, needs to be processed. That's uh, needs precision instrumentation. Yeah. That's really cool. My, my background is mechanical engineering. And so oh, wonderful. Uh, oh, we, could, we could talk. <laughs> When I started out, though, in the engineering field, well, I, I first got like a, a temp position as a draftman. Um, but when I started at the company I ended up working with for a long time um, or for a few years, uh, I started in the metrology department. So yeah. I was working with precision, uh, but laser measuring. So like yeah. measuring a giant tool, but down to the like hundredth of an inch or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, we had to do, we had some... Um projects that we had to do laser, for example, we'd have to measure, we would, we would have to come up with a solution to how to measure something in one of these big tanks, you know, like yep. you see out in these tank fields, but you can't just say, okay, well, I can't tell, you know, it only goes up, it goes up to this level. So that's how much is in it because it depends on the altitude. It depends on how much the tank bulges um, how, as it fills up, it depends on the temperature and then sometimes there's foam on top. So we were using layer laser and I mean, it was just real, really fun, fun stuff. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I thought it was always fascinating working, uh, in that industry, just yeah. the, the projects and stuff that you come up with. And sometimes, um, 
some of the fun things you do. It's things that when you talk to people in the real world, they're like, why was that exciting? You're like, well, because we had to problem solve through this piece and you had to get through this. And then, then this happened. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. I, I used to, you know, there was other aspects I didn't enjoy as much. Like I didn't really want to dive really deep into the, like, once I got into the design team, I started working as a stress analyst and I started going deeper and deeper into like finite element analysis and some of that oh, nice. really deep yeah, we, stress stuff. Yeah, we did that when we, we bought our CAD system, we had a, the finite element analysis in that. Yeah. And, and yeah. for the listeners who maybe don't live in the world or have worked in that world, that's <laughs> a lot of times what that is, is you're taking a 3D model. Um, so the CAD systems, you build like a 3D model in and then you create what's called a mesh which is basically breaking down that complex model into a simplified equation over the course of the entire surface. And then you're able to actually analyze that and get like, where's it going to break or where's the stress points going to be? And, um, yeah. you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty mm-hmm. cool when you're actually doing it, but it gets very, very like detailed and like there's people that spend their entire, you know, 40 year careers going deeper into it. Yeah. And it was something I enjoyed people more than I enjoyed the, the computer <laughs> side. So that's really cool, though. I, l- I love that as a background. Yeah. So, so, um, so you start working with um, the multinational company. Is that where you ended up doing a lot of your international travel and stuff? Um, well, I, that's where I started international. Not, I didn't okay. travel at that point. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was a mechanical designer and then I moved into management and I was managing the design department for both um, mechanical and electronic design. Um, I got really involved with quality. Um, our company was one of the first in the state to be ISO 9000 certified. And I was a part of that certified team and then the managing team of that certification going forward. While I was doing that, then um, the company kind of discovered that I had a little bit of a knack for uh, process improvement in groups. Mm-hmm. And so they would come to me and they say, okay, well, we have this issue in this department, in this group. Um, it needs to be improved. And then they say, sure, and go do it. And I would go, you know, do my deal, you know, pull together the experts, the people that really know, and then facilitate that and come up with the solutions to the process improvement and then they kind of let me do whatever I wanted to in the organization. So I, w- I took that opportunity to kind of sit and like do six months here, one year here. So I did like um, I, I did procurement for manufacturing. So I was okay. buying, you know, buying big materials and, you know, yeah, it was really it was really fun. And then uh, then I decided that, well, I loved I loved all this work. A lot of the work I did, I was working with PhDs of physics love them but sometimes <laughs> you want more <laughs> and so in my, in the building that I was in we had like maybe a thousand people in the building on the other end of the building that's where people were always laughing and joking all the time <laughs> well that was international sales and marketing so I happened to know the vice president so I said Joe can I join your group and he said yeah as long as you jump through a hoop and so he made me do like a six month gigs through uh, international contract administration, which he told me I would hate. And he was right. <laughs> but, but I did it. And then I then when I joined the international sales and marketing group, he says, well, I don't have a job for you. So you create your own job. So I created my own job. It was wonderful. <laughs> and my job was really focusing on our international customers coming into our headquarters and our customers would be like a refinery that wants to or so a company that's building a refinery and they need to buy all the instrumentation for the whole refinery. Okay. They're big projects. Wow. And so all the customers were coming to me though, and I wasn't going out. Yeah. We, we had a private jet. I'd always put them on the jet to go to one of our other facilities. I never rode on that jet. Oh no. <laughs> Cause I had to stay there. And so after a while I thought, okay, this is crazy. I'm in the middle of a continent in Minnesota I want to be more international. This is, this is, you know, this feels like the right thing. So I quit my job, um, sold my house, sold my car, sold everything I owned and moved to South America. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So you just got up and left. You were like, all right, time for a change. And you just were going to burn the ship and stay. 
I shut down my life. I told all my friends and family, and they didn't believe me I was going to do it because I had no job down there. I didn't speak hardly any Spanish. All I knew was I was going to go. And I got on a plane and I went and then they're like looking around, where's Sharon? (laughs) (laughs) Wow. It was great. That's awesome. So, um, so you touched on some stuff there before we get to that point, because I think that I'm really excited for that um, because I love international stuff. But um, when you would work with like process improvements and stuff like that, I think a lot of business owners and a lot of people that would listen to this, they probably have things that either within their, their business, they, uh, they need some process improvement. What were the steps that you would take as you entered into that? Because you probably did that problem or new problems fairly often. So every time when you entered into a new group and a new problem, how, what was your kind of mindset and how did you kind of work through that? Well, first, before I even put together the group, I identified which people had the most knowledge of what I was trying to improve. Because I was never the expert in the room, okay. but I wanted the room to be full full of experts and a diversity of experts from different angles. It was something manufacturing. I wanted somebody that worked on a line, an engineer, a technician, marketing manager, you know, whatever whatever that is. And so when I put that together, then I would, you know, sit down and, and tell them, okay, this this is what we're going to work through. Um, you're all experts you know, let's try to work on this together. And one thing that I needed to always do was that role of facilitation, you know, to make sure that all voices were being heard, Mm -hmm. all voices were being respected. And then I would set down goals, periodic goals that we would try to reach, you know, at certain milestones. And then as we were, and then I also, I would try to do some kind of celebration, not like a party, but, you know, just kind of a celebrate by, by, you know, just talking, celebrating when we hit certain milestones. Um, What was really important was when, when I complimented the people, it wasn't like, great job, Joe. You had to be very, very specific Mm -hmm. and in front of everybody else. And so it was just, you know, motivating groups, getting work groups to work together and to go through that process. And, the, and, and for me, the, I, for me, process improvement is really great. I'm really good at flow charts and stuff. So yeah. that was really nice. You know, I put together flow charts, we'd make them big and then I'd say, okay, here it is. What can we improve? Or, you know, whatever the specific question is, and then let people go in there and kind of play around too. And I, you know, I would, I would never have been able to do it by myself. Yeah. It had to be that I had to be this group. Yeah. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. No, because I think that's something a lot of us, especially business owners, we run into is like <clears throat> uh, you know, you run into a problem or you run into something and it's like, well, how do we get everyone on board and bought in to this change? Because if it's just someone from up top saying coming down and saying, This needs to change like this, it never works that way. Yeah. And sometimes I would bring in somebody that had nothing to do with this process at all just as an outsider. Okay. I I was an outsider in many of the processes, but I usually knew something about them, but I wanted somebody completely on the outside because they looked at it differently. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. So going back to Bolivia now. So you sold everything, you get on a plane, you land to Bolivia. No, actually first I went to Chile. Oh, Chile. Okay. Awesome. So what happened when you got there? Well, I had a hotel reservation, so that that's the only thing I had. So I made my way to my hotel, and nobody in my hotel spoke English. And my Spanish was, you know, I could talk about the weather. And so yeah. that was a challenge. So th- there I started learning how to do sign language. <laughs> it was not like real, real sign language, but, you know, just sp- communicating in other ways than Charades. words. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just, you know, I had to... Um, I just kind of got my bearings and um, I asked the hotel for a taxi driver I could trust. And then I hired that taxi driver to take me places. And so my goal was first I joined a Spanish class so I could learn some Spanish. But then it was really about networking because I went down without even knowing what industry I was going to look at because I knew the work I was doing in Minnesota did not exist there. 
So then yeah. it was really a matter of networking. And so I would I networked with um, presidents and CEOs of some major corporations so I could get a sense of what industries are down there, what their hiring practices were. Um, yeah. And so that that really informed me a lot about which direction I really wanted to lo- to focus in in finding a job. Yeah. And how did you how did you meet those people? Because I always think like when I'm thinking like being dropped down in the middle of nowhere, um, like where do you start? How do you start getting to know those people and finding out where they are? I just got online and started looking. And then I, you know, then then as I started networking, then I people just started telling me. And, you know, it it was amazingly easy um, because I'm from the U.S. I'm educated and so when you go into another country that's maybe not as sophisticated, unfortunately, you have certain privileges that you may or may not deserve just because you're from a European background country that has education and you grew up with good health. Yeah. So, uh, so I was always considered better than. Um, and so when I would call up a business, um, they have their gatekeepers, their secretaries, and I'd have to get through them. And so generally what would happen is I would call and I would try to speak some Spanish, but they knew I was from Europe, Europe or <laughs> U.S. And they figured, okay, if she is calling the CEO or the president, she must be very important. And, they, and I always got through. <laughs> It was so easy. <laughs> well, that's very cool. So what was the first kind of job or, or gig that you picked up uh, upon moving there then? What I just, well, I, when I, after I did, looked at things, I decided of all the industries, industries that they had, I decided the wine industry was pretty cool because it was really dynamic at the time. So I kind of studied some wineries and um, picked like a half a dozen that I thought, you know, would be kind of cool to work with. And um one hired me and I was their first international hire. It was a third generation winery. And I was in charge of their international sales and exports to Asia, uh, Canada, and um, U.S. Okay. And so that meant I had to travel around drinking wine. I was traveling all over the world. I mean, I would go to Europe also to help my colleague that was covering Europe. Um, yeah. Wow. Very cool. So when you started working with them, um, were you, they, they were already international, like exporting, importing and stuff? Yes. They wanted to increase sales and then move into new markets. So, for example, I um, opened up uh, Singapore. Okay. Yeah. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Nice. How was that? Uh, again, were you just going to these other countries and places and once you were on the ground, just start talking to people and start networking? No, what I did is I utilized um, international trade shows. And Mm -hmm. so um, I would usually have a stand there. And whenever I went to a trade show, I had something very specific in mind that I was trying to do. And then also before the trade show, I would try to identify um, potential importers because I was always looking for an importer because I only sold sold by the container load. Okay. And I wanted to go into a contract, like a two-year contract where there was an agreement how much they're going to buy and you know how much we would produce for them that kind of thing yeah and so in the case like singapore i went to where was it was it i can't remember if it was hong kong or it's just it's probably tokyo i don't remember but anyway so my goal was to find somebody from singapore and this this trade show was for all of asia and so i had a couple hits and there was one that looked really good and so then I went to uh, Singapore to look at his operation and, un- you know, understand their business more. And then uh, then when it looked like it was a good fit, then I brought him to Chile so he could see our operation and then introduce him to some Chilean customs to kind mm-hmm. of more get that uh, uh, emotional connection. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So then um, as you started, sorry, I have like, I don't know, some sort of construction going on downstairs. Yeah, I can hear it a little bit, but it's not too bad. Okay, good. I'm like, I hope that's not all coming through. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So anyways, so when, um, as you started doing that then, so did you get to travel to most of the places that you started importing and stuff like that then? Exporting. Exporting. 
Yes, I did. Yeah, because I would periodically go um, to work. What I wanted to do was always help our importers sell more because then they would buy more. Yeah. So I would go and um, work with their sales team. And um, ideally, I would I would go on, a, like spend a whole day with one of their salespeople as they went out because their salespeople would sell to stores. Yeah. And so then when they knew I was coming, then they would very often have an event set up with a store and I would be, you know, they would, people would come because they wanted to talk to me because I represented the winery. I knew the family. Um, I knew their future plans, you know, for, you know, vineyard expansion. Um, I, I knew the winemaker. I could talk about the process. And so that helped them sell more. So Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. So how long were you, was that this all with the Chilean winery then? Yes. Very cool. So what were you, um, I mean, it sounds amazing. You were able to travel and, and share wine with all these different countries and stuff like that. What, what prompted you to kind of move on from that? Well, I was in Chile for three years. And um, one thing that I didn't get from the Chilean experience that I was looking for was the exposure to more people that saw the world different than me. Okay. That was one of my goals to go down. And I also wanted to have some cultural challenge. I wanted to be in situations that felt a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. To see how I would do. Cause I didn't know, you know, each, you know, so when I decided to move on, well, first of all, nine 11 happened while I was in Chile Oh, okay. So I stopped for a second because I was going to go back to the U.S. for a little while, visit friends and family, but then I decided to hold on that. But what I did instead is I took a month off from work and I just traveled the full length of Chile because it's quite long. I mean, you have the the driest desert in the north and you have penguins in the south. (laughs) So I spent time doing that. During that time, then I was thinking about what I wanted to do. And I, I decided on Bolivia because it had the most challenge. It was the second most corrupt at the time. It's the, it was the most impoverished in South America. It was the most indigenous, well, still is most indigenous in South America and everything is broken, but their cultural, their cultural practices are phenomenal. They, they, they still have some of the practices, but even before the Incas conquered them, so wow. I went there for those reasons and it met all my expectations and it was such a wonderful experience. I spent four years in Bolivia and it was amazing. Amazing. Wow. Yeah, that is it's funny. You're putting down these things. I'm like, these are the things I'm looking for. And I feel like if you look at whether it's even not tourists, but like any sort of travel guide, it's like, <laughs> those are not the things you're looking for. You're looking for the opposite. You're looking for stable easy to integrate, you know? <laughs> yeah. And very often they say, don't go to Bolivia. It's too dangerous. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, you know, we spent, uh, we did a little bit of work with, um, gu- uh, bakery in Guatemala mm, Yeah, and, um, man, I, and Guatemala is just a beautiful country and it's right near in that same area as, as Bolivia. Um, but like, Guatemala goes through these phases where like it's the you know a great country to just go visit and stay there and then it goes through phases where they they'll tell you like don't don't go visit right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um so for living in Bolivia when you moved there what was it like I guess when you first got there what was that all like cuz you'd been living internationally but this is a different you know thing. Yeah, it was interesting too because I, you know, took a plane from Santiago to La Paz, Bolivia. So La Paz, Bolivia is at 13,000 feet. So that was my life for for 4 years was 13,000 feet. So the initial arriving was really tough. Yeah. Cuz that's really high. And yeah. so you know, I had a headache for a week. <laughs> you know, I had, you know, you drink one little sip of alcohol, you're drunk. <laughs> I mean, it's just like it was a little bit different. So but once I got used to that, um yeah, so I kind of did the same thing. I mean, then I spoke some Spanish, but my Spanish got really good in Bolivia. Um, but it was the same thing. Like, okay, I'm here. What am I going to do? So I just started networking. And uh, I decided, though, when I got there, I wanted to be an independent consultant. I didn't want to be locked down to one company because 
I wanted the, all the experience that I could possibly squeeze into my life. Yeah. And so um, my first gig was with the wine industry because <laughs> I, through network, I met uh, Enrique, who had a stock, 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 what do you call it? Stock house. Okay. What do you call it? I, I'm going brain dead here. He had, he, he, yeah, people could buy stocks and businesses that were in his portfolio. Got it. And okay. So, yep. so one of them was a winery and um, the, the morning that he met me, I met him later in the day, he had had a shareholder meeting and they were all complaining that this um, winery wasn't making enough money. And so okay. when he met me, it's like, oh, you just dropped in from the heavens. You come with all this. I was, you know, I was on the front page of the paper, wine expert arrives to Bolivia. It's like, oh my goodness. But anyway, <laughs> I, uh, I, I did a, um, I did research and recommendations. So I, you know, visited all the wineries um, in Bolivia. I went and looked at their uh, processing, you know, what kind of technology they have. I looked at their, um, their vineyards, you know, what kind of plants planting do they have? What kind of disease do they have? you know, what is their management? What are their goals? And then I was able to produce a report um, with some of my findings. And then that finding resulted in another consulting gig. So I did that. And then I moved into working with, um, I did several projects with the United States Agency for International Development because they have an office in La Paz. Okay. So I did two projects down there for them not wine related, thank goodness. It was something else. <laughs> one was one was tea. Another was uh, secondary wood products and jewelry. And then I did those two projects. And then USAID said, "Hey, we got a project in Romania. Would you mind going there?" So three <laughs> days later, I'm on the plane going to Romania to do a project there. And then I came. Then I went back to Bolivia. Okay. Very cool. So you got to travel there. How, what was that like then? Because that's that's fairly different than obviously where you'd been. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was great. I was in. I was uh, headquartered in Bucharest. That was actually wine too, but because okay, they uh, the the wine industry there had lost their major um, importer, which was Russia. Uh, Russia um, came up with a story about that Romanian wine. This is how it was explained to me that the Romanian wine was contaminated so they could get out of the contracts. Don't know if it's true, but that's what was told me. Okay. And so I, I was brought in to find the solution for all of the country, what they should do with their wine industry. Okay. And so I traveled around Romania. I had a driver, I had an interpreter and traveled around and, and I went and I tasted wines and I looked at, you know, same thing that I did in Bolivia. And then I had to make a, a big presentation to the university in Bucharest because they kind of govern that industry as well mm -hmm. as other industry um, people and um, made my recommendations and then went home back to Bolivia. Okay. Nice. Very cool. So <clears throat> you were working on all these different projects uh, in Bolivia and working with different companies and stuff. Um, what kind of prompted you to take that, to move from Bolivia? Uh, it was political reasons. Um, in my four years there, there were, I think it was five different presidents. I knew a couple of them because it's a small country. Yeah. And so I had, you know, as somebody from the U.S., in, a professional from the U.S., I did, did have access into, to the that upper echelon and also I had done a project for um, the government, for the Minister of Economic Development. I did a quick little project for him. So I was known. So I, yeah, so I had access. Um, but there, the new president that was coming in, Evo Morales, um, didn't like the U.S. He really hated the U.S. And he said he would never set foot on U.S. soil. He referred to us as the empire, which a lot of people in these third world countries do because the U.S. did some weird things back in the past. Yeah. Um, and so I could just see the quality of the projects that were going to be available to me dropping. Yeah. So I thought, OK, I've been I've been gone seven years. Yeah. So maybe I should go back to the U.S. And now in retrospect, I wish I wouldn't have. I wish I would have stayed in Bolivia longer or, <laughs> or moved to Peru. Cause I used to go when I had free time, I'd go to Peru and hang around, you know, looking at um, ruins and stuff. But yep. yeah. 
Very cool. So when you were looking at coming back to the U.S. then, again, were you kind of just like, I'm going to land somewhere and figure it out? Or what were you kind yes. of, you yes. know? Same yeah, thing. Well, what happened? Well, I decided I didn't want to go back to Minnesota. I'd been there. I had no you know, family there anymore. And so I thought, okay, well, I'm coming back as international. And I've always been intrigued by the Pacific Northwest. My parents are actually both from Oregon originally. And so I remember when I was in college, a girlfriend and I were traveling around for a few months and we spent a day in Seattle. And I just okay. remember I kind of liked it. And it was nothing more profound than that. They have a port. So it's got to be international. And yeah. so I just plop myself here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Where did you, uh, what was your first job coming back then? My first job uh, initially was working with an entrepreneur that he had already started a very successful company. It, it had to do with the banking industry. And I, he just hired me to look at putting together um, some virtual training for banks. And so it was just really trying to find the providers to do that and find the right technology. But then the main one was that um, it was a project in Mexico and it was a um, uh, residential real estate project. Um, he, he got $7 million from a, a bank in Mexico to do the initial phase of this, which was to get to the point of breaking ground. Okay. And so I commuted from Seattle, which was interesting because I'd fly down to San Diego, rent a car, and then drive through Tijuana across the border. And then, cause it was in um, Ensenada, Mexico oh, yeah. in Northern Baja. Yep. And so that was, that was great. Um, and so we actually worked with an architect in Seattle. We had our real estate marketing company in Seattle. We had our normal marketing company in Seattle. And so, yeah, that was a really great project. And I got to use, I was like his wingman in a way. So he looked to me to use all my different types of skills that I have. And also he wanted me to always poke holes in his thinking. Yeah. And so it was, it was like, I was just in hog heaven. It was really a, a <laughs> one, wonderful project. But when we got to the point that we were getting ready to break ground, it was 2008. Oh my word. <laughs> and so all our fine, all the, all the financial institutions from around the world that had been courting us for our next round of funding all dried up Yeah, because they said, we can't do anything real estate. So we had to oh. walk away. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So where did that lead you from there? Um, then I worked on another project with the same entrepreneur and we, um, launched a business in Southern California for, um, energy efficiency of residential homes. Okay. Which was kind of cool. Nice. And then after that, we were looking, um, at a project I was doing the initial, work on it to see if it was feasible. Uh, we were working with a tribe in uh, New Mexico that had had interest in putting a solar farm on a piece of their property. Okay. And so I looked and there, there was a cable going right through the cape, the corner of it. So we, we would have power from the solar farm to be able to go to the energy company. Anyway, we worked on that. And then ultimately we decided to step down from that because there was just so much upfront money required to do that, that we decided, yeah. no, let's, let's not do this one. Okay. Nice. And then Thanks. I, then I got into other things outside of that entrepreneur. <laughs> got it. Okay. So then how did you get, um, so during this time you were living in Seattle then still, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. How did you end up getting, cause you're now for our listeners who don't know, uh, you're now based out of Whidbey Island. How did you get connected up there? Well, I, I, one, the last project I had before I started with the EDC was with the Washington State University Small Business Development Center. Okay. And I would I was with them for about five years, and I was um, I was an international trade advisor, so I was working with businesses in Western Washington that wanted to either start exporting their products or improve their processes or open new markets or things like that. And so that was I, I really liked that job a lot, but. Meanwhile, we moved to Whidbey Island. Yep. And so then I was commuting for a while. And 
I, I was able to move my office from Tukwila to um, Everett. So the commute wasn't as bad because I live in Langley, the southern part of the island. Wow. Yep. So that wasn't too bad, but I really wanted a job on the island. And so this opportunity for the executive directorship of the Economic Development Council came up. And so uh, I applied for it and I got it. Nice. And I've hit, I'm, I'll be hit my five year anniversary in this position in May. Wow. Very cool. Congratulations. Thanks. Is that, uh, is that the longest you've been with a specific company or business since kind of everything you've been doing? Since back in, from Minnesota. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause that, wow. that company I was with for many, many years. So yeah. Okay, cool. How, how does that, uh, you know, how does that feel looking back? I always find memories to me always feel like almost like dreams when I'm like, oh, I can't believe I actually like lived in different spots or did this. How is that for you looking back right now? I, I kind of, I miss pieces of it for sure. And I often think about, gee, maybe I should go back and do that again. But then on the other hand, it's like, well, no, there's just so many things that you can do. Yeah. You know, why repeat something? Yeah. But yeah, I, I think back in my whole career very fondly. I mean, I had lots of challenges living in a third world country for sure. Yeah. Um, but I survived it. And I just, you know, I learned so much. I had such wonderful experiences, both in my work and personally. So I, I just think back real fondly of everything that's come to, up to this point. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. So then jumping into the, e, uh, the EDC, the Economic Development Council, um, what was your first kind of get project that you started on when you joined on with them? Well, it was interesting because when I joined, the, the EDC had kind of fallen down a bit. Um, I started at, um, at the end of May, but the previous October is when the staff happened to all leave at the same time. <laughs> and so there, so what was that like six months from the time the, the staff left to the time I started, wow. they had hired an uh, interim executive director and a, um, office person, but they were temporary. They, you know, they knew they were temporary. So they kept the lights on and then were able to fulfill uh, the minimum requirements of funding contracts that the EDC had. Yep. So when I started, it was really a matter of resurrecting this organization because six months is a long time. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was really to resurrect it and then to really examine what value should the EDC be providing to, to our community going forward. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of our listeners who maybe haven't heard of the EDC um, or haven't worked with them, Give us a, a, you know, your elevator pitch of what do you guys do and how does it help businesses in the Island County community? Sure. Um, well, everything we do is to contribute to the economic vitality of our county. And so we, ha we can look at it as different pieces. So we offer um, assistance in um, business retention and expansion. We don't want our businesses to shut down. We want them to grow. Yeah. Uh, we also do uh, business attraction where, you know, we're, we're, we want to attract the right kind of businesses that may want to consider moving here. Um, we uh, support entrepreneurship in a number of different ways. And that's an area that we're really uh, growing with. Uh, we do educational opportunities. We provide training or we partner with somebody else that does training or we bring in some kind of training. Yeah. Um, we do advocacy. So if there are policies out there that we can help advocate for, we do that. You know, that's through um, letters of support or of letters to legislators, uh, anything that really again, goes right back to the economic vitality of our county. Um, we do uh, data and data reports on our website. If you go there, um, we have a, a really nice selection of reports that we regularly update according to how often the source information updates. For example, we have an island county profile 
And a lot of real estate agents will use that because, you know, here they can, they might have somebody moving, considering moving into Whidbey or Camino Island and they can show them this profile so they get a, a sense of, you know, what's here. Yeah. And then we do demographic reports. And yeah. So it's, it's so that's a, a big piece. Um, and then we do capacity building. And capacity building is kind of a weird thing, but capacity building for us really means we're lending ourselves to other organizations to help their capacity and what they may be doing. For example, okay. we're a member of the uh, uh, Island County Tourism Committee. I'm on the, and this is, I'm on the Northwest Workforce Council, which covers the, the northern Northwest counties. Um, I'm on the IRTPO, that's the transportation technical team. And anyway, the list, list goes on. And so okay. you know, we're, we're just trying to enhance capacity by also participating. Yeah, very cool. So one of the things, uh, we've had little interactions and stuff like that, but what's really brought us to see each other on a very regular basis at this point uh, is a new project that you've launched um, and you're, we're working with a group called Rain Catalyst. Um, but before we get to them, what came up, how did you, how did it come about that you were actually able to get this grant? Because right now there's, there's this grant, educational grant and stuff going on right now um, that EDC is a huge part of and, and organizing in this. How did that all come about? Um, the grant you're referring to is called the Small Business Innovation Fund Grant, and that was that grant opportunity came up. Um, I think it was like in the fall time, and so it was a fast and furious grant application window. We those that were considering applying were told that you have to get your application in fast. You better just take a project off your shelf that you can implement with the, the funds that you'll you receive if you receive them and it has to be done by May 31st of 2023. So, <laughs> um, so we applied for, and we got, we won a $1.16 million grant. Wow. And we were, we were notified that we won it on, I think it was December 10th or something like that. And so you just look at that December 10th until May <laughs> 31st. It's like, that's not much time. And you would think, okay, $1.16 million. Oh, I could spend that. Nah, it's, it's federal money. This yep. is it's coming through the Washington Department of Commerce, but it's really um, the ARPA funds from the feds. And so everything that we do, we have to do, as a, it's a federal grant, really, even though it's from the Washington Department of Commerce. Yeah. So then, um, you know, you get the call and they say, yes, you, you got the grant. What was your next step? Well, actually, I'll we'll back up a little bit. When we were applying for the grant, when this opportunity came up, I had already met Caroline Cummings, the CEO of Rain Catalyst. Okay. I met her earlier. I think I met her in the spring on something else. And we were already starting to work together. We we're looking at, you know, what we can do for our entrepreneurship program. Cause I had actually about a year and a half ago, I uh, launched the, or I did not, I, the EDC launched um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem initiative. And that was to grow a good, strong ecosystem for our entrepreneurs in Island County. And so I already knew Caroline. I mean, we, we already became friends and, you know, I mean, we knew we resonated. And so that meant we could work together really well. And so we, we had already put together uh, an idea for what we could do in the county before this. And she gave me a proposal. It was a two-year program. We couldn't get all the funding for it here in Island County yet. So it was just kind of sitting there. So when this grant opportunity came up, I thought they're saying something off the shelf. Well, so I called up Caroline. I said, there's this grant opportunity. You want to you want to do it with me? <laughs> and so we looked at all the components that were in that initial um, proposal, took some of them, modified some and you know made it work for the requirements of, of this grant. And so Rain Catalyst is a true partner in all this. Um, they're one of their people, um, Jennifer, um, was the one that. I worked really closely with to actually write the grant application. Okay. And so if it wasn't for them, I don't think we would have got it to tell you the truth. They're that yeah. strong of a partner. That's very cool. Yeah. So then 
upon getting it then and, and actually being able to roll this out, I, I know that, um, so uh, I got to be, I'm part of the project in a project coordinator sense. Uh, and I, I'm working with the Island County or the Camino Island side. Um, but in that, you were going through applications like we were interviewing in January. So then it was like flip it over and we had to I launch know. the first class by February, I don't know, beginning of February. It felt yeah. Like. Oh, we, we, yeah, this is a, this is a very fast moving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, for those of you that don't know the, the, how this is set up, um, we needed project coordinators for this to pull all this off. All because the grant is really educational opportunities and then grants to businesses. Mm -hmm. And um, we needed somebody that really knew their, their community. So, you know, you on Camino, then we have Bristol Carter on Whidbey. And this also, we included Skagit in this grant. Yeah. Because we wanted it more of a regional uh, effect. Because we, you know, Commerce likes regional and we like regional. So it just worked that we included Skagit. And so we have Jonathan in uh, Mount Vernon that's covering that uh, in that area. And yeah. so you guys are like on the ground. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And then the, the classes that we've been able to, the, the first one was the rain cap boot camp, which was really focused in on different types of financing for business. Uh, and what's the best way to do that for your type of business. And then also, what is going to give you the biggest, uh, uh, you know, return on investment or, or ROI. Um, and now we're kind of into this next one, which we're just kicking off. Um, but t t talk a little bit about the destination creation one that we're, we're just jumping into. Yeah. Destination creation is interesting. Uh, we're going to have our second session tonight at six o'clock. Um, it meets, uh, twice, twice a week for four weeks, um, uh, two hours at a shot. Um, this is different than the Rain Cap Boot Camp. The Rain Cap Boot Camp was actually designed by Rain. Yep. And um, and so, but this one is we're actually buying licenses um, from the person who developed this program. He spent about twenty years really understanding um, this. It's it's kind of it's a to me it's a kind of a strange title because it's called Destination Creation. Yep. Um, but it's not, it's not like a tourism is where I went when, when, when they were first talking to me about it. it's really, you know, trying to make your business a, a destination, not just a business that people walk into because they happen to walk by it, but yes. they seek you out and, and how to go about that. And I must say, I'm really excited. I mean, we just had our first meeting or the first session on Monday and I am so super, super impressed by this. I'm just really excited to see how it all unfolds as we yeah. go forward. And then yeah. after this one, then we have another educational one. Um, it's the same as a rain camp boot camp, but hundred percent in Spanish. Yeah, no, I'm excited for that too, to, to be able to do that. And I, I think that's really cool that they, we, you guys plan that from the very beginning yeah. because we do have a large uh, Hispanic community in the Skagit and Island counties and, um, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'll definitely add to that on the, the destination creation. I had that same thought as like, oh, well, this is mainly for retail businesses and stuff like that. And I know, I think in a lot of ways he's tailored it that way, but I feel like the content just from the first episode um, is something that if you're an online retailer or if you're a service business, like you could really benefit from that. So um, obviously this class has already started and stuff, but um, I definitely would encourage any listeners that think this sounds interesting to, to go to the website. I'll put a link in the, the show notes. Uh, and they have a list of like when upcoming classes are happening. So, um. yeah. So now, you know, the, the participants in this program, of course, are not paying anything for any of these educational programs. If you pay, if you actually sign up, I think it's like $800 or something. Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Yeah. But it, I mean, I think it's, I think it would be worth it. And actually that was really helpful in, in them mentioning that. Um, cause you just realize like the value of that, of like you, you get to do this class for free, but it's not, <laughs> and, it's not. um, it's, yeah, we're paying for it through the grant. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but it's really cool. I'm really excited to see, especially this, the Island Skagit County. Um, you know, we're, I think Island and Skagit County, the people that live there know how special these counties are, but people that don't, aren't from this area, 
they're like, oh, well, you live in Skagit or Island. Is that, is, well, where's that cl- near to Seattle? So, like, you know, you tell people, well, it's an hour north of Seattle. But, like, the, the island of Skagit County are just very special counties to, to visit, to come be a part of and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, awesome. What do you see as the future? Uh, now, I know right now we're full on into this project, but what do you see as the future as, of the EDC as you continue to work there and, and improve and stuff? Well, I, I, le- I would like to see the EDC continue to add value that they provide. You know, we've done, a, a, I think, a really good job. You know, I have a really great board of directors. And, you know, we're, by the way, listeners, we're a private nonprofit. A lot of people think that we work for the government either the local or, but we're, we're a private nonprofit and we, we, we collaborate with the government. So, um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we've done a really good job over, you know, the last five years of increasing the value that we provide. And I want to see that continue. Um, they, it, today is different than it was before COVID. Yeah. My counterparts across the, the state where we all have very regularly, regular uh, communications and discussions about, you know, what should economic development councils be doing now? Because what we're doing now is different and there's still that unknown out there. So we're, we're trying to remain agile as we're, as we're trying to add value that we provide. And with a really, you know, there's a really strong emphasis on entrepreneurship just because entrepreneurship has always been very critical to the economy, but even more so now, I believe it's, more important. And so we really want to support our entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that are just starting out and, you know, seasoned ones that have been in business for a while. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I, I definitely am part of a lot of different business communities or, or talking with them and just how, how important small business is to communities and really the economic structure of how this country is built. Um, you know, they still provide the vast majority of jobs. I know we always hear about the Amazons and the Walmarts and the big companies, but small business is still the backbone of what our economy is built on. Yeah. So whatever we can do to continue to help them is yeah. always a plus. Awesome. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. All right. So the first one is what purchase of a hundred dollars or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? This sounds kind of silly, but I bought a tea mug that's really big and solid and huge nice. because with all this, this, this workload now of you know, doing all these really great grants and stuff, I just need to have some tea time at night where I just put in some relaxing tea and relax and I can hold this big mug. That's awesome. Yeah. That's always a good investment. Yeah. <laughs> um, who is the most influential person outside of your family in your life? You know, that I can't, that's a tough one because I have met, so many people in my career, my personal life that are so cool and each one influences me in a little bit different way. So there's not really one person that's a big, big influence for me. Yeah. Nice. Um, Okay. This is a fill in the blank question. I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank. Be a lawyer. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) What, what drew you to that, uh, that idea? I don't know. I mean, in college, I had to, there was a required legal course we had to take. So I took it and I liked it so much. I took a next one and I just, I I just, I really enjoyed it so much. Very cool. You should like double challenge yourself and become a lawyer in another country that you don't speak the language. Then you have to start do all of it. (laughs) So that could be your next career job. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Um, Who is an interesting or fascinating person that I should interview next? Well, I have probably a list I can talk to you about. That would be great. Yeah. I'm always looking for a, a new round of people because, um, yeah, as I talk to different, as I break into new pools and talking with people, I love getting a brand new group of people to, to talk to and interview. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, let's talk offline. Perfect. <laughs> All right. And lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self? I guess I would say to my 21-year-old self, 20 year old self um, Be uh, flexible and agile in your life decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you accomplished a lot of that in in what you did. 
Yeah. I don't think a lot of people have the courage to do all of the different things that you did. That's so cool. Thank you. All the different things you did. Um, awesome. Well, uh, lastly, uh, where can people find you and find uh, what the EDC is doing and all that stuff? You can go to our website. All you need to do is, uh, I won't give you the website title because it doesn't really fit very well, but it's um, just go to Google EDC Island County and we'll, okay. we'll come up and you can check it out there. Um, you can reach out to us through the website um, or you can reach out to, to me. You can, right. you can probably share my email address if you would like. Okay, perfect. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join me on the podcast today. Yes, thank you so much. It was fun. I didn't know what to expect when you asked me to do this. And yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I thought it was going to be well, more like work, but it was, yeah. <laughs> Well, good. Well, no, it seems we like we we talked a couple times on some stuff and you're like, oh, yeah, well, when I was in Bolivia. I was doing I was like, what? I was like, <laughs> OK, we definitely have to get you on the podcast because uh, it's just it's so cool. And I'm glad that you're able to bring all of that experience and all that to here in little old Island County. So that's very cool. Great. Thank you. And I want to hear more about your Guatemalan experience. So we'll talk about that, too. For sure. Yeah. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Sharon Sappington for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other islanders like yourself. Feel free to put in the notes, greatest little podcast focused on Camino Island in the Northwest. That'd be awesome, and I'd really appreciate it. Okay, guys, see you next time.